If you'll take your your copy of God's Word and turn to Romans chapter 1, over the next next 16 weeks, we're going to go through the book of Romans chapter by chapter. We felt to do this as a team. Sometimes you can, if you're not careful, you can skip over verses that aren't the most preachable verses in the world. And when you just go verse by verse and chapter by chapter, you force yourself to hear everything that the Lord wants to say to you. Does that does that make sense? So so let me say it. Let me say it this way. If (laughs) I'm just going to warn you, if you are easily offended, you're not going to like this series at all. Like you're just going to, let let me say it this way. We got a picture. God's word doesn't come with an edit button. That's, that's not in your Bible. I'm not, throw, I'm not throwing shade. There are a lot of Bible-believing, spirit-empowered churches across our nation and in Cabarrus County, and I'm thankful for all of them. But there's, there are also churches that are preaching that gospel. And they're preaching a gospel that is conforming to this world instead of transforming the world. And I hope that you choose Multiply Church as your home. But if you don't or if you ever move, please don't ever, ever go to a church where they're afraid to talk about sin and repentance. So the Bible says in Romans, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed in, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we only have one of two choices. We're going to allow the agenda of this world to conform us into its image. Or we are going to allow the power of the word of God to transform us and to go to the gates and be agents of transformation. And I'm telling, I'm t- I don't need to tell you. I don't need, I don't need to tell you there's an agenda. We've gone in this nation, I don't know if you felt this, um, but sometimes I wake up, I'm like, what world am I living in? I walk, I walk, into, I walk into Walmart, and I know on a good day, <laughs> but I walk into Walmart, and I see a candy display that is pushing an agenda of a lifestyle that goes it's not what it's not what i believe it's what this says pastor does that offend you no it off- it offends the word of god i you you hear what's going on with target and ford and the dodgers and you say what what what, what world are we living in there's a, we've gone we've gone from things that used to be shameful and then we started tolerating things that were shameful. And then we started accepting those things. And then we started celebrating those things. And then the things that once were shameful now are taking on a life of an agenda and are targeting your children and your grandchildren. And that's why we can't be silent about these issues. That's why we have to talk about all of these things. That's why we can't conform to the pattern of this world, we must be transformed. A living sacrifice is a transformed life. An, alt- an altered life is an altered life. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Whether we're talking about issues of sexuality or any other issues, that I serve a God that says, bring all of you, brings all of me to the altar. There are other people in this world, they just want part of you. And you know what part of you they want? They want the nice part. They want the shiny part. They want the wealthy part. They want the part that is all put together. I don't know of anybody else except my God that says, I want all of you. I want your shameful part. I want your past. I want your sin. I want your baggage. I want anything that you have in your life. Bring it to the altar. And God takes whatever you will bring before him and he transforms that into something that he can use to transform the world. Aren't you thankful that that scripture starts out, Romans 12, 1. It's our theme scripture for the series. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Whatever you bring to the Lord as a living sacrifice, God says, I will transform. And the, the further promise in the book of Romans is that you are more than a conqueror. We don't have to just live under the agenda of this world. We can conquer the agenda of this world through truth, through love, and through what God has for us. Are, are you ready? Here we go. Romans chapter 1. Are you ready? Are you ready? Tell your neighbor, I'm ready. Verse 18, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Did I tell you you were going to get offended? <laughs> like, here we, here we go, Paul. <laughs> just, just dive in. Tell us what you really think, Paul. Pastor, I thought God was a God of love. He is. I thought God was a God of mercy. He is. But I would offer this to you not just as a theological truth, but as a philosophical truth. There is no such thing as mercy without justice. Pastor, I just want God to be merciful. He is. I just want him to let every, just let, because of his mercy, just let everybody into heaven. He can't. Because that is not, that entity of mercy does not exist unless you have something that's not merciful. And to have something that's not merciful, then you have to have something that is just. So if I, if I had, and we could use any number of things. And so I'm, I'm going to be in, it, Paul is an equal opportunity offender. I'm just using some of these things as an illustration. But if, if I had a serial child abuser... And we just said, oh, we got, we got to just let them, just let them into heaven and let them into our schools. And, and we want, like, is there, is there forgiveness there? Is there, is there transformation available? Absolutely. But how many of you understand that there's also justice and there's wisdom and you don't take a serial child abuser and just open the doors to, to second graders? So there's, some, there's something called justice, but because there is justice, then there is mercy on the other side. And so what will happen if we're not careful because the devil is so good at not only pushing an agenda, but then he will get us as believers to fight the peripherals of the agenda and we won't get to the root of the issue. And so what I believe is that Paul gets to the root of the issue. And I want to just follow this verse by verse in Romans chapter one. So let's continue reading at verse 19. It says, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. And through everything God made, they can clearly see God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not go knowing God. And so what we have in this instance is my experience, my experience, this acknowledgement of creation. Paul says that there is nobody on this planet that has any excuse for not knowing Jesus because there is an experience with creation that points to at least the idea about God. After we were done with the safari, or with the conference in Africa, we got to go on this safari and we, we got on this four-wheel drive vehicle at six o'clock in the morning and you're driving over the African plains and up the side of a mountain and the, the sun comes up and you're seeing giraffes and you're seeing zebras and there's just this amazing display of, of God's just like, God's like, I'm gonna show off. Like, that's what he said, like, you don't need a zebra, but I'm just going to show off a little bit. I'm just going to put all of these animals. And so you've had these experiences, right? Maybe it wasn't on a safari, safari but maybe it was a sunrise at the beach or, a, or something in the mountains or a waterfall. Or you walk out and you're just overwhelmed by this sense of you have this experience. But what is going wrong in our world is that people are living their lives according to their experience. And then Paul says, Paul says this. I think this is so, so interesting. Here's, here's the truth. It's not your experience. It's your thoughts about the experience. It's not what happens to you. It's how you choose to interpret what happens to you. Watch this. This is what, this is what the Bible says now. 
my thoughts. Their thoughts become dark and confused. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise. Like, is Paul writing this to Romans 2,000 years ago? Or is Paul writing this to, the, to America today? Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. So you have, you have an experience, but then all of us have thoughts. You, don't, you may not have gotten to choose that experience, but you do choose what you think about that experience. It was the same. Do you see this in Scripture? They had the same encounter with creation, but part of them chose, part of the people chose to worship God. The other chose not to worship God. And as a result of that, their minds became dark and confused. You could have somebody, two people experience very similar situations in their life. One may have grown up in an abusive uh, household. And now as a, as a dad, they're perpetuating that abuse. They can't break free from that cycle of abuse. And so they've interpreted their experience as their thoughts say, I guess that's who I am. I guess I can't, I can't change this. I guess this is just my family curse. But you have somebody else. They were also raised in an abusive situation that they say, I am transformed by the power of the gospel. I'm transformed by the renewing of the, my mind, my sin. It, and the sins of my fathers and grandfathers are under the cross. And now they are being a godly father. Same experience, same initial experience, but their thinking is different about that experience. Can I have that uh, Play-Doh? And, and so I'm going to grab this. I want to I explain this to you. This was, this was helpful to me in understanding. So I was reading um, a neuroscientist, and she explained how... How many of you know, like, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that happens. I'm, I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not talking about the world anymore. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about what goes on. Right, like, <laughs> Pastor, I just, we, just need to, we just need to shut ourselves in from the world. No, that ain't going to work. You got, more, you got more junk going on in here than you know what to do with. Amen. Yeah. But the neuroscientist explained it like this. She said, do you know that every morning your brain makes new nerve cells? Brain, every, every morning. Isn't that cool? The Bible says God's mercies are new every morning. So you have brand new, by the way, thoughts are things and you build your brain. Thoughts are things and you build your brain. And so you have physical brain matter in your brain this morning that you didn't have yesterday. But those thoughts, they're little, ba they're little baby thoughts. They're so cute. They're so sweet. They're so innocent. They're not fearful thoughts. They're not bitter thoughts. They're not angry thoughts. But they're not joyful thoughts either. They're just, they're just little baby thoughts. Pastor uh, Harrison and Gracie had their had their firstborn and and so how many of you know that parents especially parents of their firstborn child they're not just going to expose that baby to whatever like like if Harrison Pastor Harrison takes that baby in the stroller in Publix and gets distracted by the meat manager special of those ribeye steaks I know I know those grandparents there they're gonna be on. They're gonna be on them. They're like, "That's your baby. You gonna take care. You gonna take care of that baby, right?" They're not gonna. They're not just gonna leave that baby out in the sun. Why? Because what you expose babies to affect their development. Y'all, what you expose this to. Oh, pastor, it's just it's just a little junk. No, what you expose this little this little sweet cute thought. What you expose this to. So watch this. If you wake up and the first thing you do in the morning is you expose this little baby thought to the news cycle on your phone, then what you are doing is you are training that thought to be formed to fear. You're training that thought to be formed into an anxious thought. If the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is you start scrolling through social media, you are that little baby thought because it doesn't know any better. 
What you're training that thought to do is to be formed into an envious thought. Because you were excited about your vacation until you saw the Airbnb that your friend got on their vacation. And suddenly now that thought that was so, it was so excited about your vacation. But you're like, why is my vacation not look like? And it becomes an envious thought. It becomes a jealous thought. You get a text message from something that triggers something in your memory about somebody hurt you. And it begins to get formed into a bitter thought. But what if on the other side, what if you woke up first thing in the small in the morning and the first thing that you exposed your thoughts to you say devil before before you even get to conform this into your image I'm gonna allow my mind to be transformed by the power of the word of God devil before you have at me on my day I'm gonna take my thoughts and I'm gonna surrender them to the word of God that says I am called I am a child of God I have destiny I have purpose I am more than a conqueror I am forgiven I am healed. I am whole. I am who my God says that I am. Listen, you, it's your choice. It's your choice. And this happens, this happens little by little, doesn't it? So every day you say, I'm, I'm going to go through the book of Romans with you, pastor. I'm in. I'm going to read this chap chapter by chapter. And you just begin to form every day. You begin to form those thoughts, form those thoughts, form those thoughts. And watch what the Holy Spirit will do. He will physically transform your mind. And so those fearful thoughts become faith thoughts. Those anxious thoughts become joyful thoughts. You can absolutely choose how to build your brain according to the word of God. And then, and then it moves on to this. Here's, here's, where, uh, here's where we're really, really, really messed up as a culture. So you go now from everybody, everybody has experiences. And I'm not, I'm not invalidating the experience. The experience happened. It could, it could be good experience, bad experience. But then our thoughts, then we interpret those. So it could be a good experience, right? You got a promotion and a raise. And one person's thoughts translates that experience of it's, it's according to my ability. It's according, I, I got this raise. And it becomes a, a source of pride in their life. The other person interprets that as look at God. He is so good. I'm going to be even more generous with my position, with my influence, my, my time. So you've got your experience and then your thoughts about your experience. And now you move into feelings. You move into feelings. What is happening in our world is people are choosing to worship their feelings and say, I, I feel this. And so how could it be wrong? I have feelings for this person. I, I love who I love. How could it be wrong? Well, let's look and see what the, word, what the word of God. So I'm not, the feelings are real, but here's why the feelings happen. According to God's word. Verse 24. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. So what happens is you have an experience and then you have wrong thoughts about that experience. And then because you have free will, God says, I want to change your mind. But if you don't want to change your mind, I can't change your mind for you. And so these feelings come in and God says, I have to abandon you to your feelings because I've limited myself in order to allow you to have free will. Let's keep reading. As a result, then, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things that God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserve. I'm just reading the word of God. That's what... 
it says, it says what it says, church. And so when I pick up my calendar and my phone tells me that I have to celebrate something this month, that the word says is sin. Can I keep going? Are, are, you, are you sure? Okay. You gave me permission. Paul doesn't stop. So before we get too high and mighty against an, an, an area of sexuality, Paul doesn't stop. Since they thought it was foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that never should be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin and greed. So the same God that said that LGBTQ is a sin just told me now that withholding my tithe from the Lord is a sin. Are you sure I can keep going? And wickedness and sin and greed and hate. And by the way, Jesus says that if I'm angry with my brother, if I hate him, then I'm guilty of envy and murder and quarreling. Did you get into any quarrels in the last couple weeks? Deception. Did you twist your words to get what you wanted at work in the last couple weeks? Malicious behavior. Gossip. Did you talk about your boss? Did you talk about a relative? Did you talk about spiritual authority? See, we're all, see, we're all in this together. Paul gives it. I'm not, I'm not backing down from the agenda of this world, but if I'm going to preach the whole gospel, I'm going to preach it to all of us. And that's why we got we to gotta take our greed and our envy and our hate and our gossip. God, forgive us for gossip. God, forgive us for talking bad about other people. God, forgive us as a church for words of negativity that come out of our mouth and sow seeds of discord in the house of our God. We bring it all to you, God. We bring it all to you so that we can be transformed says they refuse to understand and break their promises and heartless and have no mercy. And they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. The problem is, it's not just the world, it's me. It's in here and it's in here. And so we've got our experiences and then I got all my messed up, all my messed up thoughts about my experiences and then they make their way down into my heart and now I gotta battle my feelings of pride and my feelings of, of arrogance and my feelings of, of greed and my feelings and all my feelings and now my thoughts are messed up and, and, and my heart's messed up. So what is the solution if we're not just gonna hit this from a peripheral standpoint but if we're gonna get to the root of the issue and when I'm saying the root of the issue, I mean both in our culture and in our own lives. I don't know if you noticed, but I skipped a verse, and I think it's the key verse. Two verses, verse 20 and 23. The Apostle Paul writes, And instead of worshiping, instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. In other words, in other words, there are experiences, there are thoughts, there are feelings, and there is God. God, and at the center of it all, it's that we choose, we choose what or who we will worship. Worship in many ways means to magnify. It means to lift up. And so what's going to happen? All of us carry this around with us each and every day. It's a magnifier. We will worship. The Bible says that from the lips of children, you have ordained praise. So you don't get to choose whether you worship. The only thing that you get to choose is who or 
what you worship. Every, everybody worships. Everybody worships. And so some people begin to magnify. They magnify their experience. And they say, because I had this experience in my life, it now defines me as a person. What they're doing is they're worshiping. They're worship. They're actually, you're actually worshiping the person who hurt you. And because of that, you are magnifying that experience. And now you are living your life out of the worship of a negative event of your past. Or we begin to worship, heaven forbid, we begin to worship our own messed up thoughts. And we begin to magnify. The enemy drops a little bit of fear and then we worship that fear when we rehearse it over and over in our mind and then we speak it out. When we speak things, it is an act. What you speak is an act of worship. And so when you begin to speak all of that anxiety, when you begin to speak all of that fear, all of that negativity, all of that bitterness, all of that gossip, what you're doing is you're actually singing a worship song to the devil instead of Jesus. You're worshiping all of the messed up stuff in your mind. And then we begin to worship our own feelings. Well, I feel this way. So then I guess I define my life by my feelings. I'm not... I'm not negating your experience or your thoughts or your feelings, but here's how we break this. Whether it's greed, whether it's gossip, whether it's sexuality, is we take our worship and we turn it upward to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we say, God, I choose to magnify you. I choose to magnify you, Jesus. No matter what happened to me in my past, no matter my messed up thoughts, I choose to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who died for you, the one who bled for you, the one who has mercy for you, the one who wants to transform you. It's only through my worship that I'm transformed. I wonder if all across the house today we could stand and in this moment say, I choose Jesus. I choose to worship you. I choose to lift him up. I choose to lift him up. Come on, can somebody lift a hand and say, I choose to magnify. I choose to glorify. I choose to lift him up. I choose the King of Kings. I choose the Lord of Lords. I bless you, Jesus. Come on, let's worship him. With heads bowed and eyes closed in the house today as our altar team begins to come forward and make their way. Maybe you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor, the devil has been throwing things into my mind. My mind is battling this morning. The enemy has been battling my emotions and I don't want to to conform to any of those thoughts of fear, any of those thoughts of worry, any of those thoughts of anxiety. I want my mind and my emotions to be transformed. In this moment, would you just step out from where you're at, come forward, allow one of these prayer team members to agree with you in prayer, and we're believing for transformation in the name of Jesus. You come, you come, you come, you come, you come. Everybody else, would you, let's just keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'm going to continue to just minister. As the, Lord, uh, as the Lord prompts in your spirit, I'm believing for transformation. I'm believing for transformation. If the enemy is throwing thoughts at you, is throwing feelings at you, we want to agree with you in prayer. Maybe some of you are here and you would say something like this. You would say, Pastor... I've never fully surrendered my heart to Jesus. I've got some stuff in my past, and it's in my present, and I've been trying to transform my own life instead of allowing the power of Jesus to transform my life. Today, in a moment, you can go from darkness to light. You can go from death to life. And so if that's you with heads bowed and eyes closed all across this auditorium, I'm going to count to three. And just as a tangible uh, response, when I get to three, if you have not yet given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, when I get to three, I want you to, I want you to lift your hand high. 
I don't want you to hold back. Jesus didn't hold back for you. Don't hold back on him. And so if that's you, we're going to pray for you right where you're at. One, pastor, I don't want to live the way I've been living. Two, pastor, I want transformation in my heart and life. Three, come on, would you lift your hand high all across this auditorium? Lift it up and you can put it right back down. I gotcha, I gotcha, I gotcha, I gotcha. As I pray this prayer out loud, I just want you to pray it silently in your heart. Just say, dear Jesus, I bring you my sin. I come to the cross. I ask you to forgive me. I receive your love and I give my life to you. Help me to live wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to my purpose. I feel to pray. My heart's, my heart's heavy right now. My heart's broken right now. We have to we have to stand so firm on the truth of God's word and we won't ever back down. But my hearts are heavy for people that have bought into the lie of a lifestyle of sexuality that is against God's word. And God loves them. He loves them. He is for them. He died for them just like he died for your, our greed and our gossip. And so in a room this size, I, I bet all of us, I mean, maybe there, there are probably even people here, you're struggling with thoughts, you're struggling with attraction. Know that God loves you and that he can transform you. But you've got somebody in your life that has chosen that lifestyle, can we, just, can we just take a moment to intercede right now? Father, we lift up the individuals who the enemy is after. We break the lies. We break the lies over their identity in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you would send the right voices. I pray that you would send voices of truth. I pray that you would send voices of love. I pray that you would send voices of grace and mercy. Father, I pray that multiply church, that we would always be a church, that on one side, we're not backing down from what the Bible says. On the other side, we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And so everybody is welcome in this house to receive the transformational power of God and so I declare I declare I declare that multiply is a house <laughs> this is what the Lord says church we are not a house of condemnation but we are a house of transformation we are not a house of condemnation. We are a house of transformation. And so, Lord, we speak. I speak that word over people who are under the lie of the enemy. They are not condemned in the name of Jesus, but they are transformed through the word of God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Well, I hope the service today made a difference in your life. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we'd love to know. All you have to do is download the app and click Next Steps. We have resources we'd love to give you as you begin your journey in following Him. You know, I was thinking, Lee, mm -hmm. why is it that we don't have jingles anymore? Like what kind of jingles? You know, like the ones that people would make for their, like commercials. Oh, it like would be products. About, well, that's because we don't yeah. listen to commercials anymore. Well. I skip them. There are a couple now. I, a, I, I like them. I like the jingles. It helped me decide where I wanted to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. especially if like you wanted ribs and they were baby back ribs, yeah. you know where to go. Yeah. With barbecue sauce. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. And then if, if you needed to be stuck on something, you were stuck on... Band-Aids. Because they stick on you. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, do another one. The, the new one that they have is they say, this place, have it your way. I'm loving it. No, that's oh. a different one. Oh. 
It's a different one. I don't know that one. It's the like, kids have been singing it every time it comes on a YouTube like, ad. Yep. I wanted like, you know, I mean, give me a break. Mm, break me off a piece of that Kit yeah, Kat bar. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Wait, um, what was another one? That, oh, oh, the five dollars. Uh, five dollar foot long at Subway. We got mm -hmm. that. What about the um, Wana Wana Fanta? Fanta Fanta in your cup. Oh, that makes me want coffee. I don't have a clue. Bulgers. Oh, the best part of waking, waking up. up. Yeah, I like that one. But is it how many? How many of you drink Folgers? Well, I used to drink Folgers. I never How many of you wanted... currently drink Folgers? Let's not no, talk about the past. All these I... bougie people can't drink Folgers. What does that mean? I mean, I'm Sorry. just kidding. I know. I know. But do Why we not? know? Is that not I uh, like Folgers. It's too bougie to say bougie. Oh, is it? I don't know. I haven't had Folgers in a while, but I did like it. I like the caramel drizzle. Caramel drizzle. Mm -hmm. That's not Folgers, though. Like, it, well, it used to be like you get the tin can of Folgers, and oh, that, that was your option. Okay, maybe I'm too bougie for that. You are. I, I didn't like that. You've grown up. Mm -hmm. Now, what's your favorite jingle? 